Welcome back. Have you ever had a DNA test? I had one recently, and I was very surprised by the results. I'm part Scottish, it seems. Well, that's not so surprising, I guess. But actually, I'm part Basque too, and that really was a surprise. Well, DNA testing is just one example of the vast amounts of data that we all have become used to having at our fingertips. But although we are storing, retrieving, processing, and visualizing large amounts of data, sharing of this data has become a little bit more limited, perhaps for bandwidth or security reasons. In this next talk, Frank Munns, staff developer advocate at Databricks, will be sharing data with us, his own data, his DNA test. He assures us that no harm will come to him. So no cloning of Frank, please. Frank, how are you? Nice to see you. Can't hear you I'm yet? Very well. very well. Thank okay, you so he's much. Here. Thank you, Frank. Certainly, that was certainly the most professional introduction I had for the whole year. Um, oh. So welcome, everyone, <laughs> to this session. Okay. I guess it's a good afternoon to most of you if you are in Spain or somewhere it in is, my time zone. It is. It's early afternoon, Frank. Cool. So this is my first time at uh, Big Things. I'm excited. I hope you're excited, too. Um, and um, Actually, that session was planned to be a little bit more hands-on. I thought I could be in Spain and, and we do a mini hackathon together with my um, DNA. That was the real plan. And then, you know, other things happened. Um, sure. My intention um, was my to show you that it's just so easy to create a client um, for Delta sharing. And um, I mean, anyway, now I am doing the whole work and uh, you just sit back and, and, and listen. Now We're already we unexpected. Sure. So sure. before so we before dig we into dig my into DNA, my I want to give you a few more examples, like uh, setting the stage and explaining um, other situations where delta sharing or sharing huge amounts of data um, makes sense. So let's start maybe with the thing that destroyed my idea of, of having this, this mini hackathon and, and sharing my DNA and you coding the client for, for reading that and finding out about uh, genetic traits. It was uh, January 5th when the first version of the genetic data of COVID was uploaded. It was named the Wuhan seafood market pneumonia virus. Now, the interesting thing is, you know, that it wasn't soft wet tissue that was kind of cut out from, from the lung uh, of a patient, of a sick patient. It was digitally transmitted sequence of RNA that was sent to this, you know, tiny little uh, village in Germany where they produced the Pfizer uh, BioNTech vaccine. Um, so sharing data at the end triggered scientists all over the world to work on the vaccines that we have today. And that was not a singular event. Actually, today, sharing genetic data is is very standard thing. It's uh, huge amounts of samples are exchanged frequently, and they're used to construct those, those trees that show the mutation of the virus that exists and that um, is causing us that much trouble. Another example, three years ago, I was speaking to a oncologist. Don't worry, I wasn't sick. Nobody was sick in, in my family. I was invited for a lab tour and um, the oncologist explained me that he's accumula accumulated three petabyte of genetic data. So every patient he's treating, he's a specialist for leukemia, uh, for children suffering from leukemia. So every child he was treating, he was also sampling the DNA, and he ended up with three petabyte of data. And um, this data, obviously, he wanted to share with students. He was having like a dozen of PhD students at any given point of time. And he also wanted to share this data with befriended institutes, you know, for scientific exploration. That's a sample, the raw data file that I generated. So indeed, I got my uh, DNA genotyped. It's a very easy procedure. It costs like a hundred something bucks. And you, what you do is you spit in the test tube. I have a photo, but I didn't uh, put it here because I thought it's maybe not appropriate. And um, if you think about it, the first 
sequence of the human genome cost like 3 billion US dollars and it took 13 years. I don't remember, but I think I, I waited like a couple of days and then I got the results back. And at the end, it's this, you know, tap separated file. And uh, yeah, that genotype person, that's, that's me that you see here. So it's the same machine that you've seen on this, this previous picture that looks like a, well, like a big washing machine. It costs 1 million US dollars. And uh, this professor for oncology had 12 of them in a row. Now, the question is, what do I, if I want to have this mini hackathon and sharing my data and this oncologist professor from Munich and the Wuhan scientists have in common, we're all trying to share data in a open way, in an efficient way, in a safe way. Um, and if you look at the options that we have, it looks like this. I was trying to, to create this, this table for all of you. Now, the left column is probably the least interesting one. It's vendor to vendor sharing. This is where you need to pay for another license and where you need to, um, well, create another instance of this, this, this vendor's um, um, system. That's not open. And that's why typically we're not interested in this. If, we, if you go one to the right, look at FTP, it's a very basic protocol, isn't it? It is certainly a good protocol because it's multi-cloud. It's just such a low level that it would work from AWS to GCP to Azure. That's not the issue. But what you're doing is you're offloading files on an FTP server. So that's not very exciting. It's not live data. And what I want to show you, even though I'm not using it for the DNA example, it could be live data that is transactionally safe. So FTP is kind of uh, old and not very useful. Um, if you want to have it secure and if you want to have it cloud scale as well. And um, if, if I give you the, the keyword cloud scale, you would probably say, well, how about uploading it just to S3 and then using the S3 URLs that you get with an uploaded object? That's not a bad idea, but you're still on this level where you're dealing with the blobs, with the key value pairs that you store in S3. So you have no abstraction of a table uh, or you, you don't have a table that you could update. Now, if you project all these systems that I talked about to the right, you get Delta sharing, open source Delta sharing. And this is what ticks all the boxes. It's open source, it's open, so it's open format. That means it's vendor independent, everyone can use it. It's multi-cloud. I was actually just having a discussion with a, one of the big cloud vendors and they said, well, but you're marketing this is multi-cloud. And I said, yeah, but you can't blame us for this. You know, it's just so it's basic and yet very powerful. And this is why it's multi-cloud. It works with Pandas. It works with Apache Spark on the client side. And this is what I'm trying to show you. And you can host it yourself or you, you could use a hosted cloud service that will make your life much easier. Now, this presentation, I want to focus 98% on the open source, on the open source solution. And this is actually what you do. You go to delta.io. This gets you to the lake house. Now, the lake house, first of all, we have a whole video in the video section of this conference where you get a whole walkthrough for the lake house. And I highly recommend you to, to check out the video because I have limited time to talk about the lake house here. But to, to simplify things is the lake house is the most popular data management platform that you hear these days. It was pioneered by Databricks, but you now, now you hear everyone starting from AWS going to Oracle talking about the lake house. It's open source. This is the site, delta.io. You can look at the source code anytime and it gives you the best of both worlds. So you have the SQL access and the schemas and the schema evolution from your data warehouses. And you have the cheap, highly available, highly scalable, highly durable cloud storage um, from the cloud providers like um, S3, for example. And it's the best of both worlds. Actually, we just won um, the TPC um, DS benchmark um, that showed that this um, architecture is performing, um, well, it won the world record. So it's, it's showing that this architecture is performing best. So it's serving data from the lake house. That's the takeaway. Um, and it looks like this, this is Delta sharing. Doesn't look very complicated, does it? So 
at the end, I told you, we have a lake house. We have data in a data lake. It's a lake first approach. So your data stays in S3. You don't have to move it. Um, we have the Delta sharing server. You can host it yourself. I'm going to show you the options just in a second. You can either have a pre-built Delta sharing server that you download, unpack, and just run. And that's what I'm going to do in the demo. Or you can run it as a Docker uh, as a Docker container by, well, just getting the, the, the image from Docker Hub, or you can use the cloud service, or you could go and talk to a backend that we host for you, kind of reference implementation that is running at Databricks at the moment. So there's lots of options for sharing server. For the data, it could be S3, it could be ADLS2. Um, there's many other options. It's open source, so it can be extended easily and for the front end well it could be one of the most popular um, open source big data platforms such as pandas or apache spark or because it's a very simple rest based api and protocol it could be any commercial client i think just yesterday matei our cto announced that um, power bi is now supporting data sharing as well Right, and that's an example of a very uh, of the easiest possible client. And uh, what I was doing here, and I was showing this at the ODSC conference. This is why I'm not showing it uh, live again to save a little bit of time. This is how a client looks like, and this example is already showing you multi-platform, and it's also showing you multi-cloud. So a lot of people talk about multi-cloud, pro and con. The fact is that we can easily do it. And this was a Colab client running on Google, talking to the backend on AWS. So what you need to build a client is this profile file. Now this profile file and this example, it's coming from GitHub because it's the whole example is checked into GitHub. And um, the profile file looks like this. It contains an endpoint, uh, which is the, URL of the server, and it can contain a bearer token. And the bearer token is used for authentication. Now, using this profile file, what we do is we build a client. With the client, we can list all the existing tables. And this is what you see here. And then once you know the table, you can use the profile file and the sharing and the database and the table name of the table to retrieve the table. So what we do here is um, load as pandas, and it could also be load as Spark. So these are the two options that you have to either work with pandas or to work with Spark. And then I have a pandas data frame. Remember, one of the, the, the key takeaways for, for open source delta sharing is that we work with data frames and not with this file abstraction where there could be hundreds or thousands of files behind a data frame. And then I'll do the pandas magic. I say, you know, pandas data frame dot plot and plot the data. All right. In reality, this is looking slightly more challenging, but not very complicated. Let me just talk you through that. Again, we have the Delta sharing server that I will start in a second. The interesting thing is that the Delta sharing server is authenticated against um, S3. That means I have an IAM instance role assigned to my Delta sharing server. This is why it can access the data on S3. Now the client is talking to the sharing server, but the sharing server is not returning the data. That's a very important thing. So the sharing server is not a bottleneck for the data. Instead, the sharing server is re returning a pre-signed URL that is typically short-lived. So it could be a pre-signed S3 URL. And then the client is using this URL to access the data on S3. Now between the client and the sharing server, we have this REST protocol which is, uh, well, it's open and it's uh, well-documented in the API documentation on GitHub. I will show you this in a minute. And then remember this profile file that I talked about and where I showed you an example already. This is the, the profile file that I use on the client side with the endpoint with the bearer token to talk to the server. On the server side, I have a config YAML file and this config YAML file, I'll define the mapping um, how do I get to my data that is in the S3 bucket? Remember, I said it's a um, lake first approach, so you don't have to move your data out of the lake house. Right, and then we should look into my data. This is what I promised you. That's uh, the, the raw file that we have. Um, so it actually is a TSV file, a tab separated um, file. 
Um, it contains the SNPs, SNPs, which is a location in the genome that is known to vary between individuals and that contains some interesting genetic information. And this is what I want to dig into a little bit deeper. And you see here for every SNP, for every location or RSID that I have here, there is a, a genotype like AA. Now this A and this A means it's um, two base pairs. It's adenine and adenine again. So it's double adenine. And one is coming from, actually from my mom and one is coming from my dad. Hi mom, hi dad. Um, yeah, this is what we should try, I think. Let's see where we are. And this is uh, what should get us to the demo. Hang on just a second. Okay, so you should see my browser now. And first of all, I told you about Delta IO. This is how you get started with the lake house. Build a lake house, all open source. At the end, it's just manage parquet file. So it's open format, open source. If you want to go to Delta sharing, go to sharing and then click on GitHub. This gives you all the code and it also gives you all the instructions that you need to get started. And I want to look for minus minus conf because I remember start the server. This is the way to start the server. And that's what I want to do in a second. I just wanted to show you how to get there. Um, then remember, I told you we have this lake first approach. So I have my data in a data lake that is on AWS. That's the AWS console. I'll click on S3 and see what happens. And you see here are my buckets and that's a bucket that I created. It's called Delta FM and there's um, several folders and there is one for Genome Frank. And remember I told you that uh, Lakehouse at the end is using Parquet data. It's kind of managed Parquet file and this is where you see the raw data that is actually not too interesting because I promised you that we will abstract away all this parquet data uh, with a table with a with a data frame. Okay, so let's go there. Mm, hang on, just a second. Let me change this to to my terminal. All right, so. That's the easy two. That's uh, if I run top here, this is running on EC2. And um, these are all the files that I have. And um, actually what I want to do is I want to start the, start the Delta sharing server with the command, oops, hang on, sorry. With the command that I was just showing you, I'll start it like this and it's starting up. I have a second tab here. And with this second tab, I want to create a tunnel. And actually the server is running on EC2 um, because I don't have my browser running on EC2. Um, I want to tunnel to the server. And this is what I'm doing here with SSH. And um, then I have a third window. And remember, I wanted to show you everything in open source. So what I do is I start PySpark, which at the end um, will start my Jupyter notebook server like this. And it starts up like this. Um, copy the URL and just quickly check. That looks good. And now I need to change again back to the browser window, which is here. And on this browser window, not sure if I need this. I copy the URL and here we go. That's Jupyter open source running and talking against the Delta sharing server. I'll navigate to my Jupyter notebook. Um, I'll open the Jupyter notebook. Um, first step, what I need to do is I need to install the Delta sharing libraries. I'll click on shift return. This is running, that looks good. It's installing the libraries. I'll double check the share file that I showed you already. It's pointing to localhost four times nine, which is cool because I'm, I'm using this tunnel and it, it uses the data sharing endpoint. Um, I can list all the tables that I can see. Let's do that. It takes a second. It gives me all the tables. Remember the buckets that I have. Now they're represented as tables. I'm not seeing the individual files anymore. And this is exactly what I want. And then I can run some analysis. I can, 
first of all say, well, load the genome data, which is happening right now. So what I do is I use the profile, as I explained to you before, I use this um, naming schema of share database table name. It's loaded already. Um, that was a previous run. You see all the genomic data. It goes to 638,000. You see the genotype. Um, then I was playing around a little bit. I was doing a histogram of, you know, of the genome. So remember, we have these base pairs like GG and AG and AA. Now, the most frequent one is TT. You see, like, like here, I was doing another histogram just for fun because I could. And it shows you all the chromosomes, which, well, if you remember from biology, they go up to 23. And that's the mitochondria, which are the power structures in your cell. And they have a different chromosome. Now, the interesting thing is this one. This is a small function that lets me access in the genome a certain RSID. And if I use this function now and I'll go for this RSID, it says GG. And now I think you all you all know Wikipedia. There is Wikipedia, which is for you know for knowledge that you need at cocktail parties, and there is SNpedia. Like remember the SNPs, the SNPs. Now if I click on SNpedia, it takes me to the SNP with this number, and the SNP with this number says, well, if it's AA, it might be brown eye color 80% of the time. AG, brown eye color. If it says GG, blue eye color 99% of the time. Let's go back here. It says GG. I'm not sure if you can tell this from the webcam. You probably can't, but I have blue eyes. So the GG is the genetic correct answer. And I'm very happy that this is matching. Um, I used to have a, that's a long story. Shouldn't tell it here. Anyway, I used to have a, a, a trainer and he once told me, hey, Frank, do you know about your coffee metabolism? I said, no. He said, well, go and check your genome. That's the number you need to check in your genome for your coffee metabolism. Mine is AA. Now, AA means zero. It means nothing. It doesn't mean that I have an increased coffee metabolism. There was a study done with, I think, like 8,000 people, what you see here. And they checked them for this um, for this uh, snippet, and it uh, it was shown that uh, people with this AT or the TT genotype they have an increased coffee metabolism. That means they digest coffee more quickly, and this is why the effect of coffee goes away more quickly. And this is why those people typically drink more coffee. So my trainer was worried, but I'm not genetically. Um, um, uh, there's no genetic reason why I'm drinking as much coffee as I drink. Now, there is one which is, I think that's more the Instagram thing. Um, let's run this, AG. Um, it depends, well, it, it defines your dopamine levels, kind of. And so mine is AG. That means I'm right in the middle, which is cool. I don't worry too much. But I also don't want to be on this side. If you see the GG expression... Um, it says higher pain threshold. That's not bad. It says better stress resiliency. That's also okay. But then it goes on with all bite a modest reduction in execu executive cognition performance. That's not what I want. So I'm super happy to be in the middle. The last one is the photonic sneeze reflex. Do you have to sneeze if you look into light? Minus CT which again is in the middle. So I'm not really, I don't have a disposition for having to sneeze. Now, all this I think is a lot of fun and I hope you agree that this is a lot of fun. But as I told you, there is um, actually many more serious applications and it starts from um, sharing the RNA data from coronavirus to sharing data that is used to create a more specific treatment for children from suffering from leukemia. So all this, what I did here, I actually recommend don't try to repeat that at home. You might get some results that tell you, you know, you're more likely to suffer from a disease X, Y, Z by a factor of whatever, and maybe you're not prepared for this result. So it's a fun experiment. I, I, I was thinking many years to do it or not to do it. At the end, I did it. Um, I like this demo. It's my real data. I promise you, 
uh, I shared it with Delta Sharing. So it is tunneled now, but obviously I could open that tunnel to the whole world. And that was my plan for, for Spain, for um, Big Things Spain. I thought you just go and create this client, which is like extremely easy if we go back to to all this you do pip install delta sharing and then you need the profile file i would give you the profile file and then you say you know create a sharing client list the tables and then you say and that's the core thing delta sharing load as pandas and that's it and then you could start and 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 try you know go to snpedia and check for other trades like um Find out more stuff and 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 check my genome if you want it. Um, I've limited a, a bit. I'm not sharing everything, um, but it would be good enough for a mini hackathon. Maybe we can do that um, next year in Spain. Anyway, let me try and change back to my slides. Right. So I've done the demo. I think you understand how super easy it is to create such a client. Um, I was using Pandas. Um, I could have used Spark. Um, you could use the API, the REST API. It's a REST protocol to implement any kind of client um, that you're interested, any commercial client or any open source client. Um, We're super interested in committers, in people who want to contribute to the project. Um, as I said, it's working for Power BI. It's uh, working for Tableau. Um, there is one more thing I want to point out. Um, you haven't seen all the, the setup work that I did to, you know, to download the server, to unpack the server. I showed you how to run the server. Um, I showed you how to start the server. That's correct. We haven't looked at the YAML file. We could do that, but it's basically showing you this mapping from, um, from the share to the S3 bucket. So you need to configure the YAML file, the configuration file. Um, and at the end, that's that's quite a bit of work. I'm not saying that it's not possible, but that's the thing that you do if you work with open source um, software. What we have done is we built this into um, the Databricks account. So if you start a Databricks notebook, um, all you need to do is, well, start a notebook and then you can create a share. You can alter the share and add a table to that share. Um, and then you can create a recipient. And that's what I'm doing here. Now, creating a recipient is at the end, someone who will then get a grant privilege to access the shared data. And when I create the recipient here, I get a URL. And with this URL, I can download this share file that I showed you that contains the endpoint um, and the bearer token. And then with this share file, then you're able to connect to the shared data. So the whole notebook approach and you know you're free to implement this using our open using the open source software in a very similar way but the whole notebook approach kind of abstracts away the downloading configuration uh, operation patching upgrading of the server so if you're a company that's a very pleasant and and easy way to share data and sharing data i think is one of the the biggest topics these days. I showed you the scientific approach. A lot of people talk about data meshes, which is basically two things. You know, it's sharing data and having a governance model across all your data that kind of limits what kind of data you want to share. As I told you, I was limiting the amounts of data that I wanted to share from my DNA. Now with this, I want to conclude. Um, Delta sharing, it's a platform independent open source way of sharing massive amounts of data. I give you some examples for massive amounts of data. Remember the oncologist with a three petabyte. Um, the Databricks workspace is abstracting away the, you know, all the operational overhead of running your own server and it's abstracted away as SQL. So when I saw this SQL the first time, I was like super fascinated. And I thought like, wow, I'm not an SQL person, but you know, create, share, um, add a table to a share and then um, create a recipient and then give this recipient a grant to access the data. That's just as easy as it gets. The clients, well, we talked a lot about the clients because I was uh, using this uh, Jupyter client to dig into my DNA. Could be Pandas, Apache Spark, any open source client will do. By the way, again, the example that I showed you was not using anything from Databricks. 
You could have a notebook, a managed notebook. Um, Matei, our CTO, was showing this when we uh, released open source Delta sharing. I think he used EMR and the same three lines to connect from Amazon EMR um, to such a share. I talked about the commercial clients. And um, yeah, the first example that I was showing you, the multi-cloud example, was talking from Google Colab back to the uh, reference implementation, implementation that we have on AWS. Hopefully, I was able to show you that we tried to simplify things. Well, things is data and AI. This was the, the data part. Remember the notebook approach when it takes you like three SQL commands to, um, well, to create such a data share. And with this, well, I told you don't do this at home. Um, it could backfire. I explained this to you. Um, be careful. Talk to your doctor first or just, yeah, rewatch that video. That's much easier. And um, with this, I want to share um, some links. Like if you want to read more about Delta sharing, I published how to tutorials on Medium. There is a lot on GitHub. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, the slides, I will upload them to speaker deck and you can access the slides and have a look at them again. And um, that's it from my side. I'm happy to answer any questions. Are there questions? Frank. Thank you so much. You, do you feel okay? That's the first question. I no feel has, okay. No harm has I, come to you, right? No harm happened. I told you it's read only. Actually, there is a little, <laughs> do we have one more minute? And I'll tell you one interesting fact. When I visited this oncologist, he told me that he's writing into DNA. Do you know what they do? They have a test tube to, um, to analyze the DNA of, of the cancer patients. And they throw in blood samples from, I think, like 12 different patients. And I said, how do you know which, which, you know, which DNA part belongs to which patient? And he told me, you know what we do? We add a unique identifier to the beginning of the DNA. And they mimic the biological process, like the, the way the DNA is encoded, to add this unique identifier. So they write to DNA. I am not writing to any DNA. I'm just uh, sharing a few snippets of my DNA with people that want to build a client. Unfortunately, we can't confirm with the webcam whether your eyes really are blue. We'll just have to take <laughs> your word for it on that one. Uh, I can see they're not brown, yeah. but I'm not 100% convinced on that. But uh, we'll take your word for it. <laughs> OK, we'll try I that thought... maybe next year in Spain. Yeah. <laughs> I was particularly interested by that coffee metabolism part. And I'm wondering, I think I've had about four coffees today. So I think I'm definitely different to you on that on that one. Look it up. I, all I can do is, uh, well, you can have this little snippet in, in, in my notebook. It's on GitHub anyway. And then you look up your own coffee metabolism and you know if it's genetic or not. So I'm drinking yeah. all the coffee in the world, but it's not genetic. <laughs> <laughs> no, the SMP gear was great. Things. Yeah, these are a few things where we can't blame our parents for, so. You know, um, as you said, this is a lot of fun, but there's a more there's a serious side to it as well. Yeah. Uh, I've actually looked at my own DNA data, and and yeah, I got a few shocks about uh, my propensity to a number of illnesses. But on the other hand, I was worried that I might be at risk of other ones, and it seems to be that uh, not so much. So it's a bit on bit on all sides. But you're right. Let's be cautious when we look at this stuff. Um, just to, just for your information, there are some comments from people that have been watching this. There's one in particular okay. here from Alex, who says that this has been a great demo. So very interesting. So some very some very good feedback for you. And Thank um, you, Alex. <laughs> so if anyone here wants to share their data with Frank, the best way to do it is via the via the website. Of course, they can contact you directly, yeah. and I'm sure a lot of people will be very interested in in following up either with you directly or for looking into those links that you've provided for us. So, so thanks very much, Frank. It's been a fantastic talk. Thank you so much indeed. And I'm looking forward to hopefully seeing more, seeing more from you perhaps next year. Hopefully. Thank you for the invite. It was a pleasure to be here. Great. Thank you so much, Frank.